I love Google. In this unit, we will travel much too quickly and much too superficially, alas, through two vast geographical areas, Africa and Oceania. The good news is that you're going to hear a lot less of the disembodied voice in this unit. For the last four units, you've spent much time listening to me talk about our required works. Now it's your turn to teach each other. You already have this assignment sheet, so let me just emphasize a few points. Your presentations will be longer than the presentations you've made earlier in the year. But what's really changing is that we expect you to lead and to spark discussion. Your cultural context discussion needs to be more detailed and complete than in your previous presentations, since we are not looking at multiple works from a single culture. You need to think carefully about the works you choose for comparison. They should have important similarities in function or content or form, but also differences that reflect the different cultural contexts. For your Pacific presentations, we want you to try to make a comparison with one African work, if at all possible. We want you to include comparison slides that present the main points of similarity and difference, but don't show these slides until after you have led a class discussion about similarities and differences. In other words, first you should just have the slides up with the works. To anticipate a few other questions, yes, you will have assigned readings and quizzes, as always. You don't have any other homework besides the presentations for the first two days of this unit, or for day three when your Pacific Art presentation, excuse me, day five when your Pacific Art presentations are due. I don't have past AP test questions on Africa and Pacific art, though I do have quite a few from the College Board and other sources. Still, an important element of this unit test is going to be a long essay. This is an actual essay from the new College Board curriculum. We will allow you to use handwritten notes, but, sorry, we will not allow you to use one of the main works that you present. We're just trying to be fair. Some students will be presenting on works that are very suitable for this question, and some aren't. So we're leveling the playing field. You may, however, choose one of the works you'd use for comparison purposes. I recommend that you think about this question throughout the presentations and watch for a work that you'd like to write about. You will have access to additional information about all of the works. These sources will be up in folders on, U on Moodle. Note these additional instructions from the College Board, especially the rules for identifications. On the actual AP exam, you will get a list of suggested works by title. And for those, you will have to come up with two additional identifiers. I left the suggested works off this assignment because I want you to think that out for yourselves. Okay, finally, we're off to Africa. It's a very big continent with a huge diversity of cultures. I actually spent the summer between my junior and senior years in high school as an exchange student living with an African family in Uganda, which I've circled here in red. It's a small country with only about 35 million people, and yet Ugandans speak more than 40 different languages. They're also divided between Muslims in some areas of the north and Christians and animists in the south. In the south, moreover, the Bugandan kings can trace their lineage back through 36 monarchs, starting in the 14th century. Other tribes in Uganda formed very different social and often social systems and often less hierarchical social structures. All of this makes me very nervous about making generalizations about African art, but I'm going to anyway because you need to have some concepts to help you organize your thinking. I borrowed some of these generalizations from the College Board curriculum, others from my own reading and research. It is not an exhaustive list. Before I start throwing lists of concepts at you, however, let's stop for a moment and look at a work that is not one of your required works. You've presumably never seen this work uh, and don't know anything about the culture, but you've had an opportunity to look at a lot of art. So let's just look at it. What do you notice about this work? What things maybe have you seen before? Well, there's clear hierarchy of scale, which suggests that the fellow in the center is more important than everyone else around him. That means he's probably a king or maybe a nobleman or a priest, maybe even a god. The heads are disproportionately large in compared, comparison to the rest of the bodies. There are hands along the bottom, and they probably mean something. The figures on top, 
might represent ancestors or supernatural human beings or warriors. Don't know what that silly hat is on the guy. The human figures, however, do seem to be dressed for war. So what further information does the title give us? Why would people erect an altar to the hand and the arm? What do hands and arms do? I'm going to read what the British Museum website has to say about this work, which, no surprise, is in the British Museum. Quote, Like many West African peoples, the Edo of Benin see the various fates of mankind as governed both by destiny and by personal action. Destiny is located in the head, and personal action is located in the hand. Ceremonies devoted to the head tend, therefore, to involve ancestors and destiny, while those strengthening the hand involve an individual and his own achievements. Chiefs erect shrines to the head in their private chambers of their homes, while a man who has led a successful and prosperous life can build a shrine to his hand to represent his individual achievements and wealth. Such shrines or ikegobo, are carved out of wood. Only royalty or occasionally favored chiefs could commission a brass or a bronze ikegobo. They consist of two parts. There is a rectangular or semicircular base with a frieze of sacrificial animals. Now we know about the animals. And on top of this, a cylindrical form with a figure of a successful warrior chief. That's the guy with the hat. The image of the hand is represented as a pair of upraised hands in a gesture of holding wealth. Ikenga, by the way, this is, a, what, this is one of your required works, also means strong right arm, standing for physical prowess. Note that this work was made by still another people from what today is Nigeria. And what would you guess is the symbolism of those enormous horns? Yep, power and masculinity. We have seen this before. So the work on the left is also one of your required works. Why would we know that this is probably made for a king, even if I didn't give you the title? It's made, oh, this shit says brass, it shouldn't, it should say bronze. Big mistake, get that right in your notes. Note too that the date is three centuries earlier. What does that tell you? It tells you that this is a culture that has survived and thrived over a long period. Here's a little information from, and I apologize, Wikipedia. Quote, the Medin kings and chiefs have worshipped the hands since the time of Oba, king, Ewuare, e I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, the 15th century warrior king. The wars of expansion that Ewuare waged and won not only gave him the impetus to become a devotee of the hand, but may also have exposed him to other areas of southern Nigeria where hand worship was practiced. We just saw that, right? Note, by the way, how the king is stepping on a defeated enemy. Does that remind you of any work? How about the Pallet of Narmer or the Victory Steel of Naram Sin? So here's another work from this culture. It's another Ikegobo. What's different about this one? Well, if the title led you to say animals, careful. Both works actually depicted sacrificial animals. It's just that the Metropolitan Museum of Art and not the British Museum chose to put the word animals into the title. Remember that particularly for works from cultures where artists don't identify themselves or give works titles, that it's museums and not artists that often make up those titles. What's really intriguing about this work, and it may be a little hard to see, is the row of musketeers above the frieze. Muskets were acquired from the Europeans, who are now regularly trading in Africa. And indeed, the musketeers include Portuguese soldiers, an indication of the degree to which European powers were engaged in support of Benin's leadership at this time. Actually, kind of complicated. The Portuguese supported them, partly because the Portuguese were heavily involved in the slave trade. The British, who were trying to wipe out the slave trade at the same time, were not big supporters of the Benin kingdom. So here is a 1668 engraving of the Oba's palace complex in Benin City. Note the Oba in the foreground on horseback, surrounded by dancers, dwarves, and animals. His palace is in the background. I just thought that was interesting. At any rate, most Edo works from the Kingdom of Benin left Nigeria in the late 19th century when the British sent what was called a punitive expedition against the kingdom. So why would they do that? 
Well, as you might expect, there's some controversy about that as well, though there's not much controversy that the British troops used force inappropriately against the civilian population. The Oba's forces had massacred a British trade delegation, although apparently without the Oba's knowledge and permission. Benin had also, as I just said, long been a center for the slave trade. Slaves were one of the main goods, and I have that in quotes, by the way, that the Kingdom of Benin traded to the Portuguese for guns and other European products, and the British were committed to wiping out the slave trade. But by the time of this notorious expedition of 1897, the Edo people were pretty much out of the slave trade, and the British were eager to gain more commercial access to the region, basically to force the hand uh, of the king to allow them to trade. So most historians consider the British invasion to have been brutal and unjustified. But there's no question that the British soldiers collected a whole lot of loot, and they hauled it away without the permission of the Oba or his people. The presence of these works in museums around the world remains a controversy in the art world, particularly in Africa. Uh, we need to move on, but before I leave the fascinating culture of Benin, for now, I want to make a point that the contextual images in the unit should reinforce. Many of these peoples and cultures continue both to pursue and to update the traditions that surround these works of art. So here, for example, is the current Obas Palace in Lagos, Nigeria. So, themes in African art. First, African art blurs the distinction between objects, actions, and events. I think this is college board language, actually. Art is often meant to be used, not just viewed, and it viewed, and it's often meant to be performed. This, you'll note, is the topic of your essay, a college board essay, and it should be the focus of many of your presentations as well. A focus on performance is the reason why many of your works come with contextual images that show how they were used. And you want to talk about those images well, as well as the work. So here's an example. This may be my favorite example. I think those are really cool masks. And here's another example from the Ashanti people of Ghana. The golden stool is thought to contain the soul of the Ashanti nation. It isn't actually used as a stool. In fact, it's never allowed to touch the ground. And only the king, shown here, can touch the stool. When a British representative tried to sit on the stool, it sparked a rebellion. Mblo masks appeared in the, appear in the final sequence of large-scale public festivals known as Mblo. Mblo performances consist of a succession of dances that culminate in tributes to the community's most distinguished members. Individuals are honored, who are honored in this way are depicted by a mask that is conceived of as their artistic double or namesake, as a kind of shared identity. The masks themselves, however, are highly stylized. They aren't intended to represent the honoree's appearance. Another theme is that African art is generally more conceptual or expressive than it is representational. So, for example, the ndop, or portrait of a Cuba king, followed strict conventions. The head had to be one-third the size of the body, since this was the seat of intelligence. The individual king was identified not by his facial features, which were highly stylized. He was uh, meant to look sort of calm and outside of the world, uh, unemotional, unaffected by things around him. Uh, but he is identified by the geometric motif on the base and by his symbol, or ebol, I-B-O-L. In this case, a drum with a severed hand of it. The story goes with that. Most African sculpture is frontal, with enlarged heads, and sometimes enlarged sexual organs, reflecting the emphasis on the head as the seat of knowledge and often power, as we saw sometimes of ancestors or destiny, and also when it comes to sexual organs, the importance of fertility. Mm. Uh, note the well-endowed fang, relic fang reliquary or bieri on the left. We've already talked about how this work conveys power and authority. This photograph, by the way, shows the 38th Oba of Benin, who ascended the throne in 1979. <clears throat> Another theme is that African art is often associated with the spiritual world, and it often requires the direction, inter interpretation, intervention, activation by a spiritual specialist or a shaman. So this is one of my favorite works. It's one I've taught for the last two years, even before the curriculum was revised. A woodcarver makes the initial image and then brings it to the ritual specialist's home. 
Then it becomes the ritual specialist responsibility. And by the way, he is called Nganga, N-G-A-N-G-A, to activate the figure. The Nganga fills the special cavities of the sculpture, generally in the head and stomach region, with materials such as ash or soil or herbs, animal parts, materials that are believed to have special medicinal or and or magical powers. Over time, as clients approach the Nganga seeking solutions to problems, resolutions to disputes, various objects are added to the Nkisi's exterior. So when a problem is resolved or a disagreement is settled or the cure of an illness is decided upon, the principal parties drive a blade or a nail or a screw or some other sharp pointed object into the Nkisi Nkondi. Ah, So if two parties, for example, come before the figure to make peace with each other, the conditions agreed upon are symbolically lodged in the Nkondi with a sharp object. That's similar if you think about it to the Western tradition of signing a contract. Or say one person accuses another of stealing property. Both would go before the Nkondi, again under the supervision of the spiritual specialist, and often witnessed by the entire community. While driving in a nail which activates the spirit's power, each party to the dispute would ask to be destroyed by the image if caught telling a lie. The type of nail or blade used is actually determined by the type of agreement or remedy uh, that's being sought. So each piece represents an oath, an agreement, or an episode in the village's history. African arts often mark status and identity. Only important people in society could wear the Aka or elephant mask, which was used at the royal court. Indeed, the elaborate beadwork we see was a symbol of power. In the figure on the right, we see a hierarchical scale used to mark the high status of the senior wife. She had an important role in the society. She crowned the king. She was also charged with protecting him during his reign. The junior wife is much smaller. My guess is she got bossed around. Uh, Years ago, I took my kids to see a play about polygamy in 19th century Utah. Uh, My son, who was then about seven years old, turned to me at the end of the play and said, you know, Mom, you would make a really great senior wife. I think he meant that I have a talent for being bossy. Another theme in African art is that performance and work is often divided along gender lines, but there are some interesting exceptions. So generally, men were builders and men were carvers, and men alone were permitted to wear masks. But an exception were the Bundu masks of Sierra Leone's Mende people. They were worn by women under various circumstances, but especially in coming-of-age ceremonies. The female pool mask, on the other hand, was worn by men dressed as women and depicting female ancestors, which was actually a sign of respect in this quite matriarchal society. Women, by the way, painted walls and ceramics, and we don't have any of those uh, on our college board required list. African art often marks cycles of human experience. Uh, maturational, that's the coming of age, astronomical, seasonal, liturgical. We see that in art, really, of all the cultures we've studied. So back to these Bundu masks, which I think are very cool here on the right. You see them. Uh, they cover the entire body so that no part can be seen. Uh, again, they were worn by women to mark special occasions, especially when a girl attained sufficient maturity to enter the ranks of female Sunday society, basically a mark of puberty. So young women at this stage spent three months secluded in the forest where they would learn from members of the Sande society what they needed to know to be a successful woman in this culture. By the way, the initiation rites sometimes included female genital mutilation, which has come under considerable, and in my view at least, deserved women's criticism by women's rights advocates. Not an easy subject to discuss. Another theme is that African art often records history. So these are cultures in which most history is conveyed artistically or orally, and often works of art are mnemonic devices, in other words, devices that help aid the memory. So the Mbudya Association uh, of the Luba peoples was created in the 1700s. It was a council charged with preserving and interpreting the political systems of the Luba state and its history, you know, kind of a council to keep some control over the power of the king. 
Lucasa, or memory boards, are again these mnemonic devices that enable the elite members of the community to recall information concerning genealogy, court ceremonies, cultural heroes, clan migrations, locations within the royal compound or tribal territory. A Lucasa might also map out spirit capitals, that is, palaces of deceased rulers that were abandoned by new kings to become receptacles of the former king's memories. And again, this the line between the physical and the spiritual world uh, is often not closely drawn in these cultures. African art, again, often depicts and reveres ancestors. The Fang peoples of the Republic of Gabon de derive a sense of continuity with their past and a communal cohesiveness in the present through an ancestor cult known as Bieri. Bieri reliquary figures are placed on top of bar containers that hold the skulls of important clan ancestors. Uh, what's interesting is these are also lightweight and easily moved. These are a migratory people. In this way, they can carry the remains of their people when they go, of their ancestors when they go from place to place. The reliquary figures and the containers that were made from light materials, so they were easy to carry. By the way, we'll see this in our next unit when many of the works of the migratory societies of the early Middle Ages uh, made their greatest art in the forms of portable goods such as jewelry. African art has often been mistreated, misdefined, misinterpreted by outsiders. So I've talked about the British punitive expedition of 1897 against Benin. One of its many tragedies is that the plaques had been in an order, which showed the order of the kings through history. And as the British soldiers were just scooping them up and piling them up, they lost. They did. No one recorded the order. Uh, and what was lost was a priceless opportunity to learn more about the kingdom's history. This, by the way, is a huge issue in archaeology and art history. It's very important that sites not just be randomly ransacked, but that they be recorded very carefully because the position of objects is often very informative. We'll actually talk about this more when we get to 20th century art, but African art influenced art in many regions and especially sh helped shape 20th and 21st century art. Here you see two early 20th century paintings that are both required works, and we will talk about when we get to them, and they show the influence of African masks. Stay tuned. Materials, and there's a lot about materials in this unit, really more than we've encountered in any earlier units. The most common material in African art is wood, <coughs> which is easily carved and polished, easily transported, lightweight, but sometimes African artists use precious metals as well. Note that the golden stool is actually wood covered with gold plate. <clears throat> I talked about the lost wax method in my podcast about Hindu art. Be aware that the Benin plaque <coughs> is brass made with the lost wax method. Here we see works that employ fibers. This will also be an important element in Pacific art. You'll remember that the Great Mosque of Jene uh, I tr the other image is a wall from the Great Zimbabwe Complex. Traditional African architecture was built to be as cool and comfortable as possible. It's a hot sun in much of Africa. And that's why mud brick walls and thatched roofs predominated. The Royal Complex at Zimbabwe is an important exception. Its architects and builders employed sophisticated masonry designs that subsequently more or less disappeared from the continent. Interestingly, given these impressive stone walls, there doesn't appear to be evidence that it was used as a military site. That's something you'll need to know for your test. Uh, the kind of masonry, by the way, is ashlar masonry. That means that the stone walls were built without using mortar. We'll see this when we get to the Inca cities. Uh, and again, you'll need to know that term for your test. Africans began employing new materials after they made contact with the West. Here we see nails, beads, bottle caps, buttons, all materials acquired in trade with Europeans. But note that wood is the base for all of these works. Okay, that is more than enough to get you started. If you have any time left over, you can start researching the African work you will be presenting to class. <laughs>